Ramon Van Meer, welcome to Acquiring Minds. Thank you. Thank you for having me. This is, uh, I'm very excited. Ramon, you are the $35 million dog ramp guy. <laughs> you acquired, yeah. you acquired an e-commerce business in the pet space. You have subsequently grown that into an eight figure enterprise, more than just dog ramps now. Mm -hmm. Um, and you put out a Twitter thread about this story, uh, which is how I, I know, I know that piece. Um, although I've actually heard you on a number of different podcasts. Um, so I kind of know your story. I don't think that all of my audience will though. So, um, I want to hear a lot about Alpha Paw, which is the e-commerce business, but also your entire, uh, story because it's a good one. So before we get into the whole e-commerce acquisition entrepreneurship story, yeah. start us off, um, with your background. You are, uh, originally Dutch. So you grew up in the Netherlands. Tell us about that and how you ended up in the States. Yeah, um, I can do a very short version. Um, I grew up in Holland, um, dropped out of school when I was 15 ish. Um, then, uh, because I always wanted to do, you know, be, become an entrepreneur, um, and have done like almost a million different, uh, you know, gigs or, or try to start businesses. Um, had a construction company actually when I was, um, 19 ish, uh, for a couple of years. Um, yeah, did a, a bunch of different from construction company to promoting, um, you know, EDM raves, uh, and anything in between. And then when I was 28, uh, actually moved to the, uh, the States. Um, and that's when I started buying and selling internet businesses, uh, or online businesses. Um, and yeah, I bought an, a great. pet business a couple of years ago. Okay, great. Ramon, why was it that you moved to the States? Well, the reason I, I moved was a, um, I always, uh, was, uh, impressed about the United States and wanted to, to, uh, Built my American dream, uh, and I also met, uh, the mother of my, uh, son, um, in that time period as well. So. Okay. But you had, you had had, um, an idea about wanting to be an entrepreneur in the States from being in the Netherlands. Yeah, because I, you know, I love the Netherlands. I love Europe. Um, I family all over Europe. Um, it's, not as easy as an, for an entrepreneur to build businesses there. There's just a lot of more rules, regulations, taxes. Sure. Um, and it's just not as, um, I think where in America, you know, if you really, if you want to, if you work hard, you know, it's just, uh, easier, um, sure. for entrepreneurs. So when you, you, you come here and you start buying and selling websites, this, you said this was about 12, 13 years ago. Mm -hmm. Yes, correct. Okay. And, and so what, why, of all of the things to do entrepreneurially, why buy and sell websites, especially at that time when it was, you know, less well known, less done than it is today? Um, yeah, because I, I did like the fact of, especially with, uh, a lot of online businesses is where, um, like with my construction company, there was always sort of, it's similar like a service company. It's like the more revenue you do, the more people you have to hire. Uh, it's almost, you know, it's not scalable versus an online business. It's much easier scalable where, you know, I had an, a blog about soap operas and, you know, even if we did $500,000 in revenue or 4 million, our, my overhead was almost this, was similar to, was almost the same basically. So it's so much easier to scale. Um, and also easier to sell with an, you know, traditional or a brick, quote unquote, brick and mortar. You're, you're kind of a little bit stuck. Like some, a buyer has to be in the same location versus, you know, I've sold businesses to people in Singapore, in, you know, the other side of the country. Um, so the buyer pool, um, uh, is, is much larger as well then. To yeah, sell. Yeah. Yeah. Um, also more competitive, uh, the world of online business. So yeah, uh, that, that's the yes. one counter to that. The, but, yeah. um, let's, I want to, I want to hear about the soap opera blog that you just touched on. That's one of your big stories. It, it's a, a remarkable story, but not even the main event today, but just before we get there. So, um, you're buying and selling websites. Are you technical at all? Um, 
a, a little bit, very like very basic. Okay. Um, so yeah. So but buying and selling. I cannot build my own website. You know, I I was just hired somebody to do that basically. Okay. And so, what were the these buy, this buying and selling of websites like? What were kind of the size the, uh, of businesses that were you, you were buying? Were these really tiny sites or what? Yeah, I literally started with, um, so, you know, buying something for five hundred to thousand uh, dollars, making some improvements, and then selling them for two thousand, and then buying something for two thousand, and then selling them for four thousand. Really started small. Um, and then, you know, after a couple months, I bought a piñata website, actually, a, a <laughs> website that dropships piñatas uh, for 6000 made some improvements, made my money back in two months, and then sold that for twenty two or 25 I, I don't remember, uh, 1000 in two months. Yeah. Uh, and that's when, you know, um, it started scaling. And then I did not buy this website but I started it uh, because I didn't have, there was a website for sale that was writing about soap operas. So yeah. that's when I got the idea. I didn't have enough money to buy it. So I said like, you know what, let's just build it myself, see how, how it goes. Um, and that's, you know, by now, you know, so far the biggest exit that I have because I started with nothing and then, uh, sold that for, you know, close to $9 million, two and a half years later, three years later. Um, so, yeah. yeah uh, Ramon, th this is a podcast about acquisition entrepreneurship. So the, the stories of yeah. starting from scratch, uh, we, we don't we don't want those huge success stories of, of, of starting from scratch. Uh, <laughs> we, yeah, we should. Don't start businesses. You buy businesses, guys. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. Um, no, but that I, we're going to get into that story a little bit because it's too remarkable not to. But I will just plug somebody else's podcast, which you have um, told that full story of the soap opera blog uh, on an er I think a, a pretty early episode of My First Million. Uh, Sean Perry mm -hmm. interviews you, um, and so if people want to hear the the hour long version of that, it's it's very worth listening to. Fascinating. Um, but yeah. taking you back to this point in time, are you doing this full time? This this kind of website flipping um, is this a, is this making enough money for you that you're doing it full time, or is it a side thing um no it's, it's full-time um and but now i've bought this pet business you know close to four years ago and that's you know the only thing i'm focusing on right now because it's uh takes up all my time but yeah flipping buying and selling businesses has been my full-time job for the last 12 years so so when you got here from the netherlands and you started pretty soon after that buying and selling websites and it was pretty much pretty quickly or immediately how you could support yourself and, and you could do it full time. Cause I think you, the typical story is somebody starts buying and kind of flipping in your case, websites kind of as a side hustle. And then over some amount of time, they accumulate the capital and the, and the, the expertise to go full time with it. Sounds like you went full time pretty quickly, pretty immediately. Yeah. And it was more that I had no other, choice basically um so uh because i came here on a student visa where um i i i didn't had um I, I couldn't work basically get a job so i had to work for myself regardless um yeah. but it was um yeah because i <clears throat> i when i was buying and selling business i also had with one of my best friends an online travel business that basically paid my bills. Um, and then the buying and selling was just all extra. Um, but even with the online travel business, it was like I did the marketing, basically. It was the same type of work I was doing when I was flipping uh, websites. And these websites that you were flipping, they were content websites and e-commerce dropshipping websites. It was kind of a, a range of all the various digital types of, of businesses. Yeah, I, I really didn't matter what it was, um, con but most of them were content because that's, you know, fairly easy. You don't need a lot of expertise or a huge team. Yeah. Um, and I did a couple dropship uh, websites as well, uh, because similar with content with dropship, you also don't need a big team. I stayed away from software type businesses because you know you need a developer like it's just a different uh type of business yeah yeah 
Uh, I want to ask you about that in a second. Okay, so um, let's let's hear just the quick version of the soap opera blog story. So you you said you saw another site, I guess on on Flippa. You're using Flippa primarily for the these yep. website acquisitions. That was yes. in the soap opera space. It was too expensive to buy. So you said to yourself, "Let me let me take a swing at doing something in this niche, but I'll start it from scratch." Mm-hmm. And and then and then two and a half la- two and a half years later, you sell it for about whatever, approaching nine million dollars. <laughs> yeah. Um, so what is the yeah totally crazy? What um, yeah? Can you t- kind of give us the two minute version of that story? It's an- amazing. Yeah, um, and it was totally unexpected. It was not like hey, let's. Let's build a $10 million business. Let's do soap operas. I was just like, you know, I was just happy with building a quote unquote passive business that can, you know, support, you know, pay my bills basically. Uh, But it started really slow. But then, you know, as soon as it clicked, um, so to speak, then it started actually growing exponentially. Um, But it was one of those things where this was... um, it had all it all checked all the boxes and this is i'm talking now looking backwards this was not like for me looking forward like oh this is all the boxes this is a great idea i was just you know trial and error but mm-hmm. it was one of those things it's like it's a very niche market mm-hmm. um often and i do it same when i come up try to come up with new ideas i was like we always go for like what's the biggest idea or what's the billion dollar business or what's the biggest market uh, whatever the next idea is, you know, we want to target the whole country. Um, soap operas was a niche within a niche. It's like day t- daytime TV, but then also even soap operas. Um, but still, 9 million people watch soap operas. Yeah. Um, so it was an overlooked niche. There was, I don't think, a lot of internet geeks or wizards or internet marketers were saying like, hey, let's, you know, let's go into this niche. Um and uh, with content, for the people that may be thinking about buying a content site, um, yeah. it's very important that you always, whatever topic you choose, it's important that you there's enough new content because you want people yeah. to come back to your um, to your website. With daytime TV, with soap operas, and I didn't know this again when I started it, they run almost every single day of the year. Uh, it's five days a week. I think they only have a handful of quote unquote blackout days. But besides that, it's 50 times a day, 50 times weeks a year, there's new episodes. So you can always write about new stuff. Um, and then add on the fact that Facebook at that time was still very easy and quote unquote cheap to build a huge fan page and a huge community uh, that I then use to drive traffic to your website. Uh, you know, with any idea or any website that you want to buy, you always have to think, okay, the product could be amazing, uh, but how I'm going to get the right audience or the right traffic uh, to my website to either consume your content, buy your products, or, you know, buy your service. Um, and at that time, you know, I used utilized Facebook uh, pages and then later Facebook groups Facebook group, Facebook pages don't really work as well anymore, but Facebook groups uh, definitely still works. Um, yeah. So, yeah. so there was this there was this kind of the, the two big opportunities that intersected were an overlooked niche, but a big niche because soap operas. You yeah, know, you said it's a niche within a niche, but then you also said it's nine million people, so it, it's actually a sizable market. It's a whole industry, you know, in in Hollywood, and. Uh, it was overlooked, and then um, it was at a point in time where there was this new platform or newish oppor- or newish opportunities via Facebook that were still not competitive, and you could acquire users or or, or viewers for pretty affordable. It, exactly, exactly. Yeah. Because with at the end of the day, whatever you're going to do, service brick and mortar, or like well, brick and mortar, I'm not sure, but anything online, it's all about like okay. What is the value of a visitor or in how can I acquire that visitor for cheaper? Um, yeah. you know, so in, in with content, I made money from banner displays. I work together with Google or other so quote unquote ad networks that will pay me to display banners on my website. 
and I would get paid for each thousand visitors, I will get paid X amount of dollar. Um, so if I can just acquire thousand visitors for two dollars, but I get four dollars from Google, now you know, now you have a business. Now you've got your so. CPM arbitrage going. Yes, it, it, exactly. It, you know, I would I would think that the the um, soap opera viewers aren't the most lucrative demographic. Um, I don't know. May, maybe I'm wrong. The, the stereotype would be that it's kind of moms, um, and and you know, moms do control the pocketbooks of of families. I, I'm speaking in total generalizations and stereotypes here. So maybe, maybe I'm totally wrong about the demographic. But you know, one of the other things that when you do a content site or you do some sort of niche, you want to look at like the value of the people or the value of that topic and how much disposable income there is there, you know, how much, you know, how, how, how much advertisers and what sorts of advertisers want to reach that demographic. Um, yeah. Are soap opera viewers a, a good one or what? what, what, what yes. How do you answer that? Yeah. And it's also no genius a plan beforehand for me. I learned this afterwards or during where like the average um, audience or visitor was like 45 years and older. Mm. Um, and I didn't know that, that, but like you said, uh, even in a married, married household, it's the woman that makes almost all the buying decisions from cars mm. to credit cards to, you know, uh, shopping, you know, from all the way from cars all down to shopping. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a lot of advertisers want to reach that. Plus, 45 years and up is has a high, pretty high disposable income. Um, I had an at the same time when I had a soap opera website, I bought actually that one I bought on Flippa, a, a content site about wrestling, WWE. Um, not a fan. I don't really watch it. Uh, please don't get offended. I, I think it's great. I think it's, uh, but I, um, bought it because I saw a huge opportunity because I almost, I thought like, oh, wrestling WD is almost like soap operas for men, uh, because they have storylines and they have, you know, yeah, exactly. um, and, but unfortunately, um, the, you know, I, I don't remember the exact uh, difference, but it was almost for the soap, like just as argument's sake, for the soap opera website, for each thousand visitors, I will get $2. At the wrestling site, for each thousand visitors, I will get 50 cents. It was almost mm -hmm. a quart because the demographic was less, um, you know, uh, less, um, you know, advertisers that will yeah. be interested. Yeah. Um, younger demographic. So I, I agree with you. That's when I learned like, okay, the work is the exact the same, but if you pick the right topic, your, your outcome, you know, could be so much higher. Yeah. Um, so I would always advise to people, not just that look at what you're passionate about or, or just like random topic, but also f think about like, you know, the work is the exact same, but if I write about investing versus about, you know, toys, you'll make 10, 20 times more for the same amount of work. Um, totally. Now, investing, typically when there's more money to be made, there's also automatically more competitors uh, in that space too. But, uh, you know, uh, I definitely learned that with the wrestling. And it's a cool story. I bought it for... 20,000 um, on, or 18,000 on Flippa. And then I think it was 12, 14, 15 months later, I sold it for 220 or 240, I forgot. So that that, um, that would be an amazing outcome if it weren't overshadowed by your, your soap opera story. <laughs> yeah, the only reason I sold it is almost like, yeah, and I don't mean this in a braggy way, but it's like, yeah, my soap opera was making much more money um, you know, I wanted to just focus more time on the soap opera where I, I could have a higher return on time, basically, than the sure. wrestling. So I sold that one. It was still an amazing outcome. Um, and, um, yeah. Um, and I bought it on Flippa. Yeah. I, I actually want to get your opinion on the marketplaces and how they've evolved over the years for digital businesses. But um, just one other thing that I heard you say a, second, um, a few minutes ago. 
that your soap opera site kind of got started. It kind of was slow at first, and then there was a mm-hmm. bit of a an inflection point, a tipping point. What happened at that tipping point? Did it just Google start paying attention to the site, or was it something like what happened where there was mediocre growth and then quick growth? Yeah, um, I, I think it was like almost an um, sorry English. Sometimes my English is not, but it was like. It, it took some time to build up the fan pages. And then as soon, so I started making 50 cents a day from Google AdSense and then a dollar. Yep. And then it took a couple of weeks to get to $10 and then 20. But um, right away, I focused a lot on, okay, now 100% of my traffic is Facebook fan pages. That's never good. doesn't matter if you have brick and mortar, you don't want to have 100% of your income from one customer, right? If you have a plumbing business, you don't want to just have one because if the customer goes out of business or chooses a different vendor, then you're screwed. Um, Same with online businesses. You don't want all your traffic to come from Google search or from emails or from Facebook or from podcasts. So right away, I really focused and invested all my profits uh, back into building an email list, starting fan uh, groups on Facebook, um, tried to get my website into Google News. And I don't know how I did it, but uh, it got accepted in Google News and that started to drive SEO. So I really was focused on, you know, building a diverse, you know, diversification of traffic sources. Mm-hmm. Um, and like the email list, you know, I'm still, man, I wish I could replicate that. Like very quickly went from zero to 800,000 uh, people. Um, <laughs> oh my. Yes. Uh, and the biggest, and this is maybe, you know, hopefully somebody can use this trick. I've half of those emails, over 400,000, I collected by creating a quiz and for sure, people have seen it before on Facebook. It's like, find out what character you are on. Are. Yeah. And yeah. then you yeah. click on sure. it and you get these silly questions. Are you a morning person or an evening person? Are you, do you like to drink wine or water or beer? And then so you have these 10 questions that are totally random. Um, and then it shows like, oh, you are just like this character on this soap opera. Um, but in order to see the results, you had to give, you know, your name and email. Um, and, um, yeah, I collected 400,000 emails almost virtually free. Like I, I did boosted some posts here and there, uh, tried to get, you know, more, but hun- a couple hundred dollars max. And, and you, you um, always wonder with like a marketing tactic like that, if even though you capture the email address, are those people going to be engaged with the content that you start sending them? But I guess if they're interested enough to take a quiz about what soap opera character they are, they're probably really into soap operas and yes. w- welcomed your email. I- exactly. And then, and then, of course, with, this is a whole nother topic is then you can, you know, build email flows to make sure, you know, you have only email the high, you know, co- you know, the people that are really high engaged in your list. Yeah. Um, but that's why I like this, this niche too, is because these people love soap operas. So whatever I did, a quiz, a puzzle and giveaways, like people were eating it up. So it was almost uh, versus, you know, the audience for the wrestling didn't that you know, I tried it there. It worked okay, but nothing compared to the soap operas. Because I think, huh. you know, the younger demographic, more tech savvy, more, you know, not they're interested in wrestling, but it's not their whole life, you know. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So yeah. It's funny, I because I think of wrestling fans as just rabid fans. Although I guess soap opera fans are are kind of the joke about soap opera fans is also that they're really, really into their soap operas. So, um, yeah, like if you have to sit down and because I've watched, you know, pieces here and there, I've never really watched the whole because it's just <laughs> like so it's so slow, basically. Uh, but if you know, you have to have a lot of commitment to sit every single day uh, from one to two, uh, basically, and watch a show. Um, yeah. But yeah. Uh, okay, Ramon. So you have this incredible. So that I mean, that's just a, an unbelievable story. You make a life changing amount of money from this acqui- mm-hmm. from this sale. 
Um, you and you did it in a short amount of time, two and a half years. Uh, and so now you're looking at your. Can, can I ask how old you were at the time of acquisition? At the time that you sold your soap opera business? Um, yeah, um, I have to thirty six, thirty seven. Thirty seven. Okay, so um, still yeah. many years of a career ahead of you. Um, and so you're looking around at your opportunities, and what what are you thinking? Digital has treated you well, so obviously you want to stay in digital. People know that the end the end of the story here is that you buy e commerce. But te- go back into your mind, your frame of mind at that point, and what were you considering next, and how were you just yeah. making that decision? Yeah, and by the way, looking backwards, please don't take my advice. Like I wish I've done something different, <laughs> but I. I wait, bought. wait! You wish you you wish you had done something different than the e-commerce? No, then. So, when I sold the business, the and I got the money. Um, looking backwards, I actually should have t- took a break and really think about what's going to be my next step. Instead, I bought several online businesses. I bought an e-commerce business. I bought a YouTube channel, a content site, and a SaaS business. Um, and then a couple other things, but I basically bought three totally different online businesses that you looking backwards, it's now like, of course, uh, it's very makes sense, uh, but you cannot really share resources even, or like to, you know, to build a team around a SaaS business is totally different than an e-commerce and totally different than a YouTube channel. So you dif- you need different skill sets, different people. It's a totally different business. So looking backwards, I wish I just, you know, really was more, uh, uh, you know, thought it through of, okay, what's going to be my next step, my next project, and then really just go on there versus just buying a couple of random businesses. Yeah. Um, so I bought a best pet business that, you know, went from, um, I bought it for $300,000. Um, at at that time was doing $700,000 in revenue, um, close to $200,000 in EBITDA. Mm -hmm. Um, and I was able to buy it, uh, for fairly cheap, especially, you know, considering the valuations now are even higher, but I bought it for 325 plus inventory. Mm-hmm. Um, the reason why I wanted to buy it um, was because the website was old. Um, there was almost no paid marketing. So there was a lot of low hanging fruit that me as a marketer thought, okay, I can buy this and I can double, triple, quadruple the revenue um, and then increase value and then flip it. That was actually the idea of when I bought it. To, fl- to flip yeah. it. To, to just optimize it over a relatively short amount of time and, and not build it into yeah. a business. And, and Ramon, let me ask you. So, so um, this uh, Alphapaw is the name of the business. Alphapaw, the Alphapaw acquisition was your e-commerce acquisition mm-hmm. while you also bought the YouTube channel and the SaaS and the, and the other? Okay. Um, and what happened to those businesses? Well, when Alphapaw started to take off, you divested yourself of them? You sold them? Um, yeah, the YouTube channel I still have, but it's more, uh, and this is, this may be a good story too. It's like, you know, a lot of podcasts focus on success stories and I think that's great. Um, the YouTube channel is actually not a success story. I bought that for over a million dollars. Um, I used an SBA loan. Um, probably you talk about SBA loans on your podcast because that's, you know, how, um, you can buy businesses uh, with little money down. Um, it was doing around $60,000 in revenue, uh, a month. And, um, I forgot to profit, but you know, it was a YouTube channel. So the, there was not a lot of overhead, um, for, because of several reasons, but YouTube made a couple algorithm updates. Google made search made algorithm updates. Um, and it's now doing, you know, probably 10,000 a month. Um, so it basically almost breaks even for my SBA loan. <laughs> the, so now granted that if I only had that business and did not have the e-commerce and all the others, and I could focus more on it, I probably could have made it work. Um, but it's definitely not a success story. Um, yeah. So, you know, I know 
you know, this is maybe not a positive uh, to promote, but I think it's very important for people totally. to know that, you know, this business was 10 years old and was historically very stable, but then a YouTube decides to do, you know, an update that could affect, you know, either go, you know, in some cases it could affect you positively, you know, can up go up in rankings. In this case, it went down and it like went like, like it took a year, but slowly, you know, went from 60,000 to 50,000, 50 to 40 and, you know, 45. Um, well, Ramon, and, as, uh, as, a, as a content guy, a guy, you know, who had, you know, made his fortune um, producing content and, and recognized the value of SEO, you, you, you understood that a YouTube channel was vulnerable to algorithm changes. So you, you, I'm sure you saw that risk. And so when yes. you saw the algorithm change, you bought the business with an SBA loan, then you saw the algorithm change occur, you probably panicked because you, you were sophisticated to know, enough to know like what this means. This is really, really bad news because there's so much channel concentration. I mean, there's just there's just the YouTube algorithm. Like your entire um, channel depends on on that on how the algorithm favors the channel or not. Yeah, exactly. The only because my you know going back to the pet business, you know that was growing. You know, we went from seven hundred thousand dollars when I bought it. The first year we were able to do seven million dollars in revenue <laughs> the next year 18 million dollars it was growing so fast i like my mindset was like okay you know what the youtube channel i just like i can put 10 hours a week trying to fix this uh or grow that a little bit or i can f put the 10 hours back into the pet business and what where would where is my return on time the highest and i made the decision to just like I will fix the YouTube channel later when I sell the pet business um, and, um, you know, focus, you know, put all my energy on the pet business. Um, just two the things about the SaaS business. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, okay. Sorry. Just two things about the YouTube channel um, before we really dive into Alphapa. Um, first, I'm surprised you could get an SBA loan for a YouTube, YouTube channel. You're the first person I've heard to be able to do that. Um, did, did you have a hard time getting that loan? Did you have to really look for a, a lender who uh, would do that for you? Um, well, the broker I used, Quiet Light Brokers, um, re, uh, introduced me to uh, an SBA broker. I don't know, his official, Stephen Spear. And yeah, e-commerce funding. Yeah. Um, I mean, I cannot compare how easy or much more work it was than an other SBA. Like, it was a lot of work because at the end of the day, day, SBA is government. So it's just like, you need a lot of paperwork and, you know, I need to, I think they pulled up a traffic ticket I had eight years ago and I had to explain that. And, <laughs> uh, so it's definitely more work than a traditional bank. Um, but it's t t totally worth it. It was not yeah. uh, a lot. Of, it was just collecting a lot of tax returns and paperwork. And, sure. uh, I think it took, you know, months or something. To close. And the channel, can you tell us what the channel is or what it was about, what the subject matter was? Yeah, it was, it was like a listicle um, uh, channel. So, you know, top, you know, the top 10, you know, podcast microphones. Oh, sorry. Uh, the top, you know, all kinds of random uh, facts and, you know, lists. Um, and uh, yeah. Yeah. I, okay. I'm gonna. I still own it, and I'm still, you know, my plan is to revive it and 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 work on it later. Um, but yeah, that's why, you know, I bought a couple of businesses that had no synergy. Basically, it was not like um, they couldn't complement each other. Um, and you know, if I would have, you know, can do it over. If if I would buy different businesses or multiple businesses, I would have at least done it where they complement complement each other or in the same category. Um, yeah. But, you know, you live and learn like this. Yeah. You know, I make more mistakes sure. than, uh, you know, than wins. So um, and then. So what, attra a, what attracted? Go ahead. Your SaaS business. Well, very quick about the SaaS business, too. I bought that one also in Quiet Light Brokers, and we ran that for close to two years. Um, was very um, was very passive, almost on autopilot, and 
but decided to sell it so I could focus more on the pet business. Um, and, um, yeah, I bought that one, I think for 500,000 and then sold it for, you know, not a lot more, but I, I made profit on it. Um, and, so. and what was, it, what did it do? The SaaS? The SaaS was an, a to do app, uh, similar nowadays you have a lot, you have to do list and, and there's tons of these, you know, productivity apps on your phone. Uh, but this was really, you know, this was built 14 years ago. This was before the iPhone. Um, and it was, you know, I, I still like the product. It just with SaaS, again, you need technical people around you, like a co-founder, ideally. So if you, if you want to buy a software business, you know, you know, look for a technical co-founder. Uh, because yeah. even if you don't have to build more onto it, you still have bugs. You know, Apple makes a new update or Chrome makes a new browser update, you know, that can crash your website. So you always have to have, you know, you're always going to have development work. doesn't matter, you know, uh, how you spin it. Um, so, yeah. The e-commerce business, Alpha Paw. So, so yes. one of the things in your in your thread that uh, on your Twitter thread that you talk about is like you know you you when you look at for a business to buy, you look at things for things that you can improve. So you're looking for some some weaknesses in the business where you can really come in and add a lot of value. Um, did you see that? I, you've already touched on a few of those again, but let's let's go through those again. So um, yeah. it was under optimized. It was um, you took it to Shopify. So so. Um, indulge me and go through those again. And um, yeah, and then I want to ask a follow up question about how you would tell somebody else, like if they were looking at an e commerce business today, what you would advise them to look for. Yeah. Yeah. So, similar like real estate, I would always want to buy something that I can improve and increase value. Uh, I will never buy a business from a fellow internet marketer uh, that I don't see like at least two, three, four things I can change that hopefully, you know, you know, you know, you don't know, but hopefully you have a high confidence level that it will increase revenue or, or, or profit. In the case of Alpha Paw, it was, uh, they were first, they were not doing paid advertising. So they were not running Facebook ads, Instagram ads, YouTube ads, nothing. So there's $700,000 in revenue was pure coming from organic. Pretty cool, you know, pretty good, you know, uh, um, f that they did that. But I yep. thought, okay, running Facebook ads is a no-brainer. Um, secondly, they were not doing any email marketing, even to their existing customers. They were not sending updates or, you know, hey, a new product launch or anything, um, let alone capturing emails from people that visit your website, you know, or doing contests, um, you know, uh, or, you know, do a quiz. What kind of breed are you? You know, you have to give your email and yeah. then, you know, you get emails from us. So, and then third one was the website was very, was based, was built on Magento or something. It's like an e-commerce mm -hmm. platform. Mm -hmm. Um, and, um, the website was just like design was not um, like didn't look good. The copy was not great. The pictures were not great. You know, the, the, the company was built by two guys from Australia that, you know, did an amazing job with products, but were not as, you know, experienced in, in internet marketing. Um, so I just did very simple. I right away moved the website from Magento to Shopify, made new pictures for the, from the products. Um, rewrote the copy, the sales copy on the website. Um, I started sending emails to customers and added a pop-up to the website, connected that to MailChimp, very simple and, and, and cheap, you know, email uh, ESP. Um, and then I created some simple, basic video ads uh, and posted on and Facebook or like, um, you know, did Facebook ads and then see how it went. And that's when, when we started Facebook ads, that's when we were from, you know, doing $30,000 one month to 150K the next month to 250K the month after, 400K the month after. Um, 
And that's when I saw like, hey, actually, this is fun. This is growing really fast. You know, the, everything is amazing. Uh, let me just focus on this business and try to, you know, make this big. Yeah. And the what year is this now, Ramon? Uh, I bought it November 2018. So um, 2000, early 2019 is when, you know, we saw this hockey stick growth. Yeah. It, one of the things that people um, often wonder when, when they acquire a business is like, why am I the one lucky enough to get this business? Like lucky enough. Like, you know, there are a lot of e-commerce. I mean, now there's huge amounts of e-commerce buyers out there. But I'm sure even in 2017 and 18, um, other people looked at this opportunity. Other people looked at the business. If It, it was probably on Quiet Light's website publicly um, and passed on it. So, you know, you had to tell your, you had to convince yourself that like, you know, th that you saw all this potential in this business, even though these other people who are also sophisticated e-commerce buyers chose against it. D mm -hmm. Did that, you know, it's kind of like, if I'm the one buying this business, more savvy people, more, you know, m better resourced people have passed on it. Why, what do they see that I don't that made them pass on the deal? Did, did you have that thought process at all? Um, yeah, because in this case, I didn't buy it on Quiet Light, this one, but um, the reason why I was able to buy it for so little is because they were trying to sell it for a while and couldn't. Um, and I think the reason was a lot of their financials and all these things was a little bit of a mess. Um, and it was not an easy business to take over because they had... Um, three PLs in UK, in Australia, in the United States. And it was like a very, uh, it was not a clean business per, per se. Yeah. Like they didn't have their ducks in a row. So I think that scared off a lot of buyers. Um, and, you know, I think, but again, I was more lucky than anything. I don't think people, um, including myself, I didn't know that ramps, dog, like so many people would actually need and buy dog ramps. Um, again, same with the soap opera side. I bought the dog business not thinking, oh, we're going to 10x or like, you know, 30 exit. I thought, oh, we'll just do a couple small things. We go from 700K to 2.5 million and I can flip it for, you know, four times and make my money back. Mm -hmm. Um and, you know, it just started to grow much faster than I expected. So I think nobody, including myself, saw like, oh, dog ramp, you can sell $35 million of in dog ramps, basically. Uh, I didn't even know people use dog ramps when I saw the listing. I didn't, like, yeah, it was a totally new thing for me. Uh, I have a pit bull, so I don't really, you know, my dog doesn't need any furniture or help to get on the sofa. Um, so, yeah, I think that that was particular. Um, but that goes back, like most of my quote unquote successes were not $1 billion ideas at the time, if that makes sense. It was not like, oh, this is going to be huge or, hey, I want to buy something that makes me, you know, a billionaire. No, there was like my successes were all like me thinking like, oh, this is great business and I can maybe, you know, 5X my, you know, investment. Yeah. And and, and, and so would you advise people? Is that kind of like, don't overthink it? Don't necessarily, like maybe markets are, markets are bigger than you think? Is that kind of the takeaway there? I, I wonder what the advice is there. Yeah, I think first that, you know, the dark ramp is a niche business too. Soap operas was a niche business. Wrestling is a niche. I think niches are very powerful. Um, I don't know how to translate that into a brick of mortar type uh, situation, but um, especially online, I think don't overlook niches. Like I know a person that makes a lot of money selling knitting uh, equipment. I know another person that actually sells knitting patterns and makes millions of dollars selling just patterns um who could have, you know it's just like yeah. the weirdest things but they're because they're in a niche and actually the niche you can do the easier it is to market actually yeah. um in my opinion like for me it was oh 
if you have this breed, you are your dog is very high risk of getting IVDD. Here's a product that can, you know, potentially prevent that disease. Boom, and that was basically the hook. Um, and uh, so I think, you know, going into don't be afraid of niches. Actually, I look, I love, you know, niches. And of course, it has to have a specific size. You know, if the topic you're looking into only has like, you know, 10,000 people, you know, potentially, you know, interested in it, that's too small. Um, so, yeah, I don't know if it's helpful, but... No, it's great, Roma. The, the the one of the things that people in the world of of call it the world of search. So a lot of the acquiring minds audience are are people who are looking for traditional businesses, not digital businesses, to buy. Okay, and they're typically, you know, they going to buy a business that could be a twenty year old, thirty year old business from the retiring owner founder. And there are a lot of businesses out there like that, but not a lot of high quality ones. And so the process of search and finding a business that is really worth it to buy with an SBA loan, um, finding a good business is hard. And it takes searchers six months, 12 months, 24 months to find those businesses. In the world of e-commerce, um, do you think that the opportunity that it's like that, that it's kind of a needle in a haystack, that Alpha Paw was a needle in a haystack? Or like when you used to, or maybe still do look at quiet light or other e-commerce listings, you just see opportunity everywhere. Like, I guess what's the ratio of, of, of business listings for sale e-commerce businesses that you see to ones that you actually think are worth buying for an entrepreneur? Yeah. Um, I think, um, especially in the last couple of years, the buyers, the size of buyers, of course, increased, but the size of sellers too, like the listings, you know, also, um, I think it's less because I also, you know, we talked about it before we started recording, like I'm looking at, you know, uh, um, because of, you know, my friend Cody Sanchez, he's the preacher of like buying, you know, brick and mortar, boring brick and mortar businesses. So she got yep. me a little bit hooked on that. Um, so I'm just like, snooping around on biz buy sell whatever the website is um yep for traditional but like you said like the whole experience is horrible like i think i've submitted a form like i saw a business like oh i want some more information and learn about it like not potentially not per se buying i just want to learn about it um mm -hmm. and more I, I barely get response first of all uh, it's just like a whole, the, the, just more cumbersome process uh, versus with the online businesses, probably because it's online. Um, when you go to Quiet Light Brokers, you see a listing, you fill out your email, you get within two minutes, you get access to their whole business, their P&Ls, the summary, they already did all the work. Um, a, vi a video then, recording with the founder, like it's Video amazing. recording. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. And then you send an email, hey, I want to talk with the buy or seller. The next day you have an interview. And then brokers like Quiet Light, they also have access to funding. So they have access to SBA lenders. They have access, right, that can help as well. And actually, they even pre qualify listings too, where, where you, they already did all the hard work with an SBA lender. You, if you are interested in buying it, you just have to, you know, do the personal side that is far less work. Um, so they, you know, everything is much smoother. Um, so I think, long story short, um, it's definitely, you know, I will not rush it. Um, you know, when I bought Alpha Paw, like I'm always looking without really being in the market. So I'm always like looking on these websites because I just love you know, window shopping um, yeah. and learning. <laughs> um, but I think it will still like really f to find something that you're comfortable with that's in your price mark or in the range um, that also now, you know, with online businesses, unfortunately, while it's good for the sellers, now there's so many buyers. Uh, maybe it changed in the last two months because of macro, you know, trends changing. But um 
up to a couple of months ago, it's not unheard of that um, somebody got 10, 15 different offers, right? Like, yeah. so yeah. Um, that's, I think, more where you find a business that you like. Now it's a whole other story of like you getting the business without, you know, overpaying too much. Um, yeah. Because there's a lot of buyers um, in, in this, this world. But yeah, there's... Um, if I, I, can, I always recommend Centurica.com, yep. spelled with a C. They have a marketplace engine. Maybe you've already talked about it in your show, but you know that's what I you know I sign up with, with their email list. So every every day or whatever, I get basically email with the latest listings. Um, so and that they aggregate from all the all the various brokers, so you don't have to go yeah. to, from Quiet Light to whatever website closers to FE international, they're all right there. Yeah. There's like, there's so many now, even, you know, because the whole industry grew, right? Like, you know, more buyers, more sellers, uh, also more brokers, um, you know, on the market. So there's like 20, 30 different ones. Um, so yeah, Centurica. And then also, uh, Centurica does the due diligence for you. So for first time buyers, or even if you're not first time, that's something I really highly recommend is to yeah. hire a due diligence company. And But Ramon, when you get these listings and from email to you from Centurica, so you're keeping an eye on the market and just window shopping, is hmm. your impression, do you often see listings that you're like, oh, that, I, you know, if I weren't already working on AlphaPaw, I'd love to buy that. That seems like a great opportunity. Like how often do you have that sensation? Um, and, and it kind of to compare it to biz by sell, a, a, a lot of people who are looking for traditional traditional business on biz by sell, they just don't feel that way very often. They're going through all these listings and they're like, oh, no, 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 no. You know, none of these are really very appealing businesses. Is it the same sensation that you have when you're looking at the Centurica listings or is it or no? It's in fact, it's like, oh, no, there seems like there's opportunities everywhere. Competitive, but opportunities everywhere. Yeah, I think definitely online. Um, and I'm trying to think maybe what the reason could be. Uh, I think there's more opportunities online. Um, if you go to Centurica now, I will bet you there's over 10 pet related e commerce businesses for sale. Versus if I go to Biz Buy Sell and I want to buy a donut shop in Austin where I live, there's maybe one. Uh, donut yeah. shop. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> and so maybe it's that. Maybe there's just more because it's, in, you know, online. Uh, you're not, you know, locked into a location. So maybe there's yeah. just more uh, listings. Um, and um, so I do have that way more. I have to protect myself to really like not get too excited because I know, you know, I don't have the bandwidth to, to buy another business. Uh, so yeah, you, you learned that like, lesson. Oh man. Yeah. Like, oh man, that looks amazing. Um, we can do, you know, I could do X, Y, Z. And then I start daydreaming, uh, what I would do with that business. And, um, but yeah, it's definitely, um, I have that a lot. Um, and I don't, to your point, I don't actually have, the, but I also have never bought a brick and mortar website or sorry, brick and mortar company. So when I see those listings, I don't really know, is this a good deal? Is this not? Is this like, that's why I'm just trying to learn basically versus with an online, I very, because I've been doing it for so long, very quickly can, you know, assess, oh, these are the low hanging fruits. Oh, this is where it's underperforming. Oh, the value is pretty, you know, the asking price is pretty reasonable. Um, oh, these are red flags that, you know, I should look out for versus with a brick and mortar. If I look at a donut shop, like, I, I don't know, like what, what does an average donut shop, uh, do? I don't like revenue wise. How many people, uh, do they have, you know, running the donut shop? And is that more or less than average or, you know, things like that? So I don't, because of my lack of experience, I don't really have, you know, a good sense yet. Well, it, it, it raises the question then why why are you looking at um, traditional businesses? What what has Cody Sanchez said that's been so convincing to you, especially as a guy who's already demonstrated his ability now twice 
to build digital businesses of, of, of really respectable size? Yeah, it's a good question. Uh, because I think, you know, um, the reason why I'm still working too is because I like learning. I like, you know, yeah. I like doing and trying new things. Um, I think similar like with real estate, like, I think it will be cool to own something that you can touch and go to. And my son, yeah. I have a 12 year old son and, you know, you know, um, not that I'm buying a donut shop, but let's keep with the donut shop that my son can, you know, <laughs> just work there, uh, or whatever brick and mortar. Um, you know, and probably I'm going to look more something closer to the passive side where I don't, you know, will probably not buy a plumbing website, uh, or company, sorry. Um, <laughs> um, where, you know, I have to actually work as a plumber. Um, but, um, yeah, I think it will still, and I think there's, um, I think it's similar, like a soap opera niche. I think it's overlooked by the online internet marketers. I think there's a, like, because I know several people that do brick and mortar roll-ups and they're yeah. printing money. They're printing money, like, and it's more. What are the roll-ups in? More, uh, funny enough, plumbing. Uh, I know a plumbing, um, a phone, or like an internet service. Um, so uh, internet service polls or something. Um, I know dentists. I know vets. Like, you know, all these, uh, because they're in the vet space. And I think in dentists, it's a pretty common thing where like PEs buy the, like, you know, owner operated dentists. Um, and then the only thing they do is, okay, we can right away share resources, marketing, bookkeeping, accounting, customer service, uh, all these can be taken off the plate um, and, you know, run uh, and do a roll up. And it's, it's very, more stable than e-commerce like you know e-commerce is fun when it goes up but i've you know i i go to the you know emotions every week where we have a tough week where revenue doesn't go well or facebook ads are not performing or um container ships are stuck it's at, at you know in front of the port we all read the articles last year right like where supply yep. chain still to now it's it's horrible for us um and it was a very tough year last year because of that um all these things you know i think it's less uh with you know brick and mortar let me two so, last questions for you ramon and on yeah. this point about e-commerce and the difficulties of e-commerce what would you say like for somebody out there who's listening to Acquiring Minds, who's kind of intrigued by e-commerce, but maybe they don't know a lot about it, mm -hmm. what would you tell that person that, you know, they should, like, if they like this, they'll like e-commerce, and if they don't like this, then they should really stay away from e-commerce? You've kind of just answered that, like, if you can't handle ups and downs, <laughs> there's a lot of ups and downs in e-commerce. Any, anything else like that, that either you would tell somebody is a real, a real pro of e-commerce or a real con of e-commerce? Yeah, I think with e-commerce, there's a lot of moving pieces. So you have to be able to move with the punches, not just like emotionally with re revenue, but also, you know, there's so many things that can go wrong um, because it's, you know, something is produced in China or Vietnam or wherever it is, then it has to be, you know, then you have to deal with a freight company. Then you have to deal with an import, uh, uh, you know, the customs. Then you have to deal with a trucking company that gets it to the warehouse then you have to deal with a 3pl company and then you have to, like there's so many um so you need to know a lot and that's only operations yeah. and then you have to talk about marketing and then you have to talk about website and then you have to talk about customer service so you know with running an um you know a successful or like a large or quote unquote large uh, e-commerce you just need a lot of people um, so it's not, it will be very hard. I know a couple of people that do it with a very small team, but in, mm -hmm. in general, you just need, you know, in the, a big team and you need to know a lot about, you know, a lot of things. It's definitely not a nine to five, you know, um, you know, versus my content site, 
I mean, I, I did work, you know, weekends and stuff because I wanted to, but it, I didn't need it to. Uh, with e-commerce, you just, you need like this, you know, because you're talking with people in China and you're talking with, you know, um, so, you know, time differences. You know, and it, it, on My First Million, um, Sean Purry talks about I'm um, doing an e-commerce, he's doing an e-commerce business. And mm -hmm. I think I've, I, the, the story, the, the inspiration to do an e-commerce business, um, he tells the story of being with you and your phone is like, the cash register ding is just going off constantly as you guys are hanging out representing, yeah. you know, your Shopify sales. And so he's like, man, what, what, what is this all about? Uh, that sounds pretty good to just like have this, you know, <laughs> my phone ding with a new sale, like every, whatever it was, 10 minutes or half an hour. Um, so that would give somebody the impression, obviously it inspired Sean, that would give somebody the impression that it's like, you know, the money is just coming in, um, passively to use that dangerous word um yeah but but you're telling us that your e-commerce business is anything but it's it's really a lot to manage yeah and it's i think it's also like you have to uh one of my friends actually always talks about is like you have to uh figure out yourself like what type of business do you want like on a personal side because i know several people that have an e-commerce business but are considered a lifestyle business, meaning they're not really focused on high growth. They're not really focusing on selling. Uh, and, but it's netting, you know, over a million dollars and they're selling, you know, it's almost like on autopilot because they, they hired a couple people that they trained, they invested a lot of time in training them. And it's basically the same products, the same ads, the same email list. And, and, but they really treat that business as a lifestyle business. Um, mm -hmm. And that is, you know, and they work less than 40 hours. Um, mm -hmm. And um, well, that sounds pretty I good. I made the decision. Yeah. N like netting now, netting actually, a million dollars a year for less than 40 hours a week. Like, yeah, <laughs> give me that. I wanted to see if I can make build Alpha Paw into like a huge business and sell it for, you know, 100 plus million. Um, and that's why I, you know, okay, let's focus on growth. Let's focus on, yep. you know, uh, and, 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 you know, so it's, it's also within the e-commerce similar to like with content, there's different types, like maybe, you know, um, you sell a product that is made in the U S and you just do one product mm -hmm. and, you, and then it's a much easier, um, you know, uh, operations like we have you know 50 products so you're dealing with 50 different manufacturers and you know getting making sure to understand when to reorder when is you know what's the sales velocity if you just have one or f let's say five products then yeah you can do that by yourself or a very small yeah. team uh, yeah. if it's manufactured by one company in the US it also takes out you know several steps of not dealing with a freight company, customs, you know. Um, so we do our fulfillment in-house. Um, you know, it's another story, but you know, most people use a 3PL, so there's less headache. Um, so, so you can definitely build, quote unquote, a lifestyle more passive than I'm doing a business um, in e-commerce. Ramon, the last question I want to ask you is about circling back just to the, the whole theme of acquiring minds and, and, and really mm -hmm. why I had you on here to tell your story of acquisition entrepreneurship. I've heard you say in other interviews that um, you know, you're a proponent of acquisition entrepreneurship because you're a one to 10 guy, not a zero to one guy. But in fact, you have done both. You have done zero to one and yes. you know your biggest exit was zero to one. So um, just, you know, uh, talk, talk to talk to me a little bit about that and why for somebody who's been so successful starting something from scratch and yet you remain kind of a big proponent of acquisition entrepreneurship and in fact see yourself more as a better acquisition entrepreneur than some a start from scratch entrepreneur why is that yeah and I think this is one of those things that 
there's no right or wrong. Basically, it's the same debate as, you know, building a team in-house versus remote. I think it's all based on personal preference. It could work both ways successfully. Yeah. Sam, I think he tweeted a couple of days ago, he likes to build versus buy because, you know, when you build from scratch, you can put your soul into the business. I, f- I forgot his tweet, right? Uh, so there's different, you know, roads to, you know, success. Um, I've done both. I, what I think, especially if you're new, like I also have done internet marketing for the last 12 years on the day to day, right? Like I know a little bit about, well, I know a lot about SEO, a little bit about email, Facebook ads. Like I know everything that is needed in order to start your own, you know, business. If you're new to it, I think it's safer um, and have a better um, and less risky um, to buy something that's already rolling. I can give an example of the Alpha Paw. Including in the sale came uh, patents to the product, all the contracts with manufacturing, uh, a website, domain, SEO traffic, uh, a customer list, um, trademarks, you know, uh, a, a Facebook page with 2 million likes, an Instagram account with 400, you know, followers. So they had a whole bag of assets that if I would start that from scratch, it would have taken me a year, if not longer, to get to that same level. Um, yeah. So it buys you speed, in my opinion. Um, and you can literally just focus on buying something that lacks the skill sets that you have. So if you are good at sales, um, you can buy a good B2B business that sells leads or whatever, um, where you can see opportunity like, hey, with my sales skills level, I can, you know, triple the leads or triple the sales. Uh, or if you're a good designer, then find the websites or things that like really have a good product, but horrible design that of course will, you know, affect conversion rates. Um, so I think with buying something, you can find, you know, it's the same with, uh, I said in another podcast, you can buy a lot, build an apartment building, and then, you know, rent it out. That works. A lot of people make a lot of money doing that. Uh, the downside is it will take one to two years before you even start seeing return on your investment. Mm-hmm. Or mm-hmm. some people find an existing apartment building that is a little bit, you know, run down and they fix it up and then increase the rent. And that's how they increase value. Um, mm-hmm. Both ideas work. There's not right or wrong. Um, but I think, you know, it, especially if you're new to it, same to building, like I want to buy a lot and then start building. I have zero idea about like how difficult it is, how much it costs, how, you know, permits, but I have a good friend of mine that that's what the only thing he does. He buys lots yeah. and builds, you know, gas stations and other stuff on it. And that's his niche. But then I have other friends that buy apartment buildings make them better, improve them, and flip them. Um, it's the same with internet marketing or internet businesses. Um, so I think it's a safer bet for people that are new to internet uh, businesses. Great. That's great, Roman. That was, that was, that was awesome. Sorry, that's a little bit how, long answer, but yeah. Not at all, not, how, how can people uh, find you on Twitter? What is the Twitter handle? And I, I will be linking to the, uh, your, your viral Twitter thread, but tell people what the handle is, please. Yeah, um, Ramon Van Meer. Um, I don't know, actually, if it's all together, but if you search Ramon Van Meer, uh, I'm not super active lately on Twitter, but I'm going to try to be more active. But um, if you have questions, uh, DM me. Um, I always try to answer as many you know, DMs as, as I can um, to to help out. Cool. I could I could see um, audience members sometimes want to ask guests about a particular deal they're looking at. So I could see people looking at e-commerce deals, reaching out to you and saying asking if you might glance at it uh, and give your quick opinion. So if that's something you're yeah. open to, yeah. Awesome. Uh, for sure. Awesome. awesome. Ramon, thank you very much. What a story. Um, really glad I, I got you on here. I've, I've 
I've kind of followed your career from afar. So I was, I was honored to, that you came on the pod. So thanks very much. Yes. Thank you too. Bye-bye.